Hello and welcome to the Designing Music Now podcast, a podcast dedicated to the art and technique of creating music for video games. I'm your host, Dale Crowley. And I'm Michael Sweet. And today we are very honored to have with us Two Feathers, which is a composer duo consisting of Elvira Bjorkman and Nicholas Yartberg. They first started in 2012 and they worked on such incredible songs as Angry Birds 2, Hammer Watch, Battlefield Heroes, and their current new game is Aragami, which is a beautiful game sort of set in a pseudo Japanese slash Chinese world. It's a thief-like game. Throughout the podcast, we're going to be listening to some clips from the music from the upcoming game. And here is level one, Yamiko. I apologize for this, but we lost video for the first half of this interview. The video will resume halfway through the interview. In the meantime, we will be showing some images from Two Feathers and the games that they have worked on. Welcome to the show, guys. Thank you for having us. Hello. Hello, by the way. <laughs> um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about some of the projects that you've worked on, that you're working on, and, and also your background and how you, uh, how Two Feathers came to be. Right now we are uh, working with a stealth game called Aragami. That's our current uh, thing that's going on. Uh, making both music, sound, implementation, too much things for only two people to do. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we'll manage somehow. Uh, going to release in autumn, September-ish, October-ish. We don't really know. It's to be announced. Uh, so that's what's going on now. And uh, again, we met through our old band, Overworld, a uh, metal band. Uh, a little bit of metal core meeting melodic metal, I guess. Uh, so that's, yeah, well, do you want to take over from it? <laughs> uh, yeah, so that was about 2012 or so where we met. Right? And um, we both realized that, oh, we kind of shared the same background in which games we played. And with that, what kind of music we just do in terms of gameplay and uh, they're like, what what were our favorite games and the game music? Like, oh, it's the same. Hey, maybe we both should write something together. Uh, so we started doing that. Also, we studied uh, uh, game-specific things. Like, I studied game design uh, in Stockholm, and Niklas studied uh, game audio in another town called Skövde. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so we had a lot of in common there and already had that kind of goals uh, separately. Exactly, yeah. So we, kinda, we, we had the same, like, we studied kind of the same area and we shared the same passion for music. So we started writing some tunes together just for fun. And then we had the opportunity to write uh, music for our first game. We took the opportunity. Yeah, we took it. <laughs> uh, so, and what and that was your was like, first game? It uh, was a game called Hammerwatch, a uh, PC game. A PC game sold very well, like 800,000 yeah. copies. Yeah. Uh, four player, multiplayer dungeon crawler. Uh, people we met on a bar. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of how it usually works oh you find your best people I don't... yeah but we got recommended by a friend yeah so through a friend on a bar sudden pitch we didn't really even have a company we had just like started talking about doing this i had made like two songs as a portfolio you know just trying it out a little bit and suddenly it was like you know situation was sharp it was like you know <laughs> what do you call it it's, i guess we need to start a company <laughs> we guess we need to do this now you know because we kind of pitched ourselves as an already complete product and or... <laughs> you were still students at the time right yes yeah so in that you mentioned a little bit before about how you were um uh, on your current project, you're doing uh, composition and sound design and, and implementation. On your first gig, were you also into that, or do you kind of grow into those other areas? Well, personally, I had never really worked with implementation before that, so for me, it was only writing the music and sending it away. Yeah, well, I, the implementation part probably came from me uh, doing uh, game design uh, in 
it's a similar to, but not on that project. Uh, that was just pure music. Yeah, but you had started uh, studying loop, loop at least uh, implementation. All right, yeah. Um, but so that's how we grow into it, I guess. Right. Okay. So did you learn? Go ahead. So, sorry. Did you learn some of those implementation things at school too? Uh, it sounded like you came a little bit from a game design background. Did you learn a little bit of that, uh, I, I guess, before you, you guys connected on a music level? Uh, yes. Uh, we did a lot of you know uh, school projects where we made games and so on. And I always took care of the sound in it as a hobby uh, and the music. So, and we had to be able to implement everything else like UI and so on. So there was a time where I had so many hats <laughs> <laughs> on doing different things. I had a, making an ammunition system and how it would show up in the UI while I tried to make my own kind of audio system beside oh. it because we couldn't use any middlewares because I didn't know what that was. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I just made, tried to make what whatever I could do within Unity. So I had to do a lot of my own things in a sense so a lot of c, uh, c sharp <laughs> nice cool now let's listen to another clip this one is called path of shadows from the upcoming game origami Very cool. Um, and one of right after that project, after Hammerfall, you guys became interns at different companies. And uh, Elvira, you were at uh, at, at Rovio. And mm -hmm. uh, Nicholas, which company? The, the, the company that made um, Battlefield Heroes, right? Yeah, at EC company. It's just called right. EC, I think. Yeah, I e think I. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Easy Studios, yeah, uh, I think. Yeah. Exactly. I was interning there as I started as a QA intern. On my in my last year of school or so, and um, I kind of I was like you know the naggy intern where I just oh I, I, it's so fun doing QA but you know I can also do some sound work for you if you needed to because that was like what I was studying for. I, I want to like, talk yeah. about that a second because that's how I got started in games too is doing oh, QA yeah? and Thank I you. think and that was 20 years ago but you know. <laughs> But I think that's something that a lot of people don't realize is just get any job in a game company as an intern, whatever you can do, and move from there. I've heard so many stories of people that have done that successfully. So great, Absolutely. great point. I mean, yeah, I, I, I thought it was a really good way of getting into the uh, company, or I mean, in like the game development. But not only that, it was so nice to be a part of that uh, project in that area because you learn so much more, not only like, oh, this is how sound design in video games works, but having like the experience and all, I know now how QA works, so I now I can work with that when I work with sound and all, and music, mm -hmm. and now I know how I can work, co to work with graphics designers and programmers, and it was just a very good start to just uh, start with QA, learn how it works in game dev for real, and then, you know, learn more about it. So I really like having that as a start, it was great. And then after a couple of months, I got an opportunity to do some sound intern. Um, and then after that it was a two months ago, I was offered a, uh, a short, uh, yeah, a sound design job at the same company. So wow. it was kind of like an from QA sound design, a uh, sound internship and then some position. Wonderful. So it was great. And Elvira, your work at Rovio, uh, how did you go from being an intern to actually writing the music? for Angry Birds 2, which is just hugely successful and, and really great. Here's the secret. I wrote this as an intern. What? <laughs> <laughs> Are you serious? Yes. Wow. That's impressive. Uh, so, 
I never went from intern to writing it. I just <laughs> suddenly that was the thing I did, kind of. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I started there uh, as a sound design intern. Music wasn't on the table at all, really. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just glad that I could land a sound design internship because that's pretty rare uh, yeah. to have. Um, and uh, there was right like the Angry Birds project was called ABBA at the point. I was not supposed to be Angry Birds 2, but something else like of course, ABBA. yeah, of course it was a short for Angry Birds. I can't remember Angry Birds something something. And so we we thought it was fun to have it like ABBA because we're a Swedish studio, but the Rovio is a Finnish <laughs> company, so it was like our thing. <laughs> uh, and it was it was just one month from um, being sent as a prototype or a, like a green light uh, prototype or whatever we call it uh, to send it to Rovio in Finland to get it green lit mm -hmm. um, as the project uh, it was back then uh, and there was no music in that prototype at all uh, and uh, so I thought like are we going to put any music in here I mean that's good for a pitch. Um, and so uh, they kind of said, I think, I can't remember if they ever said, go on, make it, or if I just did it and put it there. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, in my head, I remembered it as I just started to make it without really asking that much if I could. And then just, you know, implemented it and thought like, hell, if someone complains, then we'll just remove it, right? <laughs> Uh, but it went in and it was there uh, at the like first little intro screen. It was like this uh, very Super Mario inspired Hawaii kind of theme <laughs> because they were listing all the bugs before. So it was like <laughs> in the beginning. And then the real game kind of started. Uh, and one of the tracks I made for that prototype, that's one, one of those tracks are actually still in the game, but wow. refined. Um, and then three months later, I got called into a meeting uh, that was called something like uh, let's decide the composer or something like that. I, I, I knew they were going to decide and I thought like, hey, they will. OK, so I'm, I'm invited there for courtesy. I'm the intern. You know, uh, I had my fun with this. Let's see who's the big shot that will yeah. <laughs> just get this job, you know. Uh, and they were chatting away on Skype because, uh, of course, it was Swedish and fin Finnish uh, people talking over Skype. Uh, a lot of people I haven't met before, and um, but the audio director, the head, not not even audio director, head of audio in Robio, the entire head of audio, he was just sitting there quiet, like you know, hmm. like scheming almost, <laughs> just sitting there. Uh, and then he kind of just did like. It, like <clears throat> yeah, like he, his throat. Yeah, yeah, cleared his yeah. throat. Uh, and everyone got quiet. And then he like just laid it out there. Are you serious? I think Elvira should do the music. And I was wow. like, what? <laughs> <laughs> like, you, you know, when you can feel all the heads just turns to you. And I've been quiet the whole time, you know, just being polite, sitting there listening in to all these very experienced people talking about what they talk about <laughs> uh, and felt like this must be a very hilarious joke, you know, <laughs> I was like, thinking when is the candy camera or something coming, you know, <laughs> felt very unreal. And I didn't believe it until I actually got there a month later. And he said that uh, again, uh, like presented me, no, not presented, what's it called? Uh, pres you? Yeah, presented. presented me to other people inside Rovio as the composer for this game. And wow. that's where, you know, kind of it's like clicked for real. <laughs> that when you meet someone, it's like, okay, so this is real, real. And then I got Henry Sorvali as a producer for uh, music tracks and also as a mentor, oh, uh, cool. kind of. And he's been on Rovio for a while and done quite cool soundtracks for, for the Epic, Angry Birds Epic soundtrack, but also mm -hmm. uh, been in a band called Fintroll, uh, also. That is pretty big black metal band. <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> one, one question I wanted to ask about the um, when you were an intern and you did this music, did you do the music 
um, at, at home and bring it in? Or did you do it as part of your internship, uh, that first demo that like, just in terms of was, was the company supportive of you doing sort of music on the side at work? Or did you sort of have to do it at home and sort of bring it in outside of the duties? I think people would be kind of interested in terms of what kind of relationship you had with the company at that point. Well, obviously, this place we're sitting in now, our studio now, we didn't have that. <laughs> so I, I, I think it was, from a, yeah, it was both. Uh, I didn't have a studio, studio like an audio studio in, in the Stockholm office. There was a lot of audio studios in the Finland office. Uh, but the Stockholm office was quite new. Uh, and on the audio team that was, it was me and it was Jonathan. That was the mm -hmm. audio team, kind of. Uh, and I sat by a laptop uh, and had like, I had bought my own MIDI keyboard. I'm trying to see if I had it here. Oh, but... no, it's not here. It's too bad. It's like this tiny. <laughs> <laughs> you know, traveling like two, MIDI two keyboard. Two octaves or something. Yeah, exactly. It's, you know, half uh, 44 keyboard or half a uh, 61, maybe half a 61. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> this big, pretty much. Looks like a toy. And that's what I composed most of the entire soundtrack at with my own wow. um, sample libraries. No, virtual instruments. That's yeah, what it's called. Sample yeah. libraries. Yeah. Which yeah. libraries did you end up using uh, for this? It was a lot of, uh, uh, during that process, it was a lot of um, East West, East West mm -hmm. Play, and so on. Uh, didn't have much else. Uh, we had bought that with a lot of your saving money because uh, that was our an only investment oh. into the company for the Hammerwatch soundtrack. Exactly. So brought that kind of, you know, with it at home. And then, you yeah, know. basically when we got our first job, we like, I, I took my saved student money and put it on like buying this sample pack of just East West stuff so we could get going. That was before the Composers Clouds you had to, yeah. to buy. You know, the entire, the entire thing, uh, cost it quite a lot. So you used that. that yeah, I used that and some other things, um, playing around in Logic, I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, but then we revamped it over. Then I, they, they um, invited me to come over for four weeks in total, but divided in two weeks separate. Two weeks in summer and two weeks in autumn, uh, where I could sit by with Henry. And we could redo a lot of the tracks together uh, in a bit better, like um, libraries and so on. And uh, also, we also recorded a lot of the instruments afterwards. All the brass and, and woodwinds and percussion is recorded by uh, Stakula. Uh, and the bass lines and guitars and uh, casus and, record, and vocals and everything we could record in his studio, Henry's studio, we recorded together during that time. Uh, so a lot of recordings as well. Let's talk about the implementation a little bit because that's really the fascinating thing that you created such incredible music in 10 megabytes or actually the music <laughs> was a little bit less than 10, right? Because you had that 10 megabytes included the sound effects. Yes, it was a total uh, yeah. six megabytes for the music. Wow. And so when did they tell you that? <laughs> a pretty late, I guess, the, the, like the actual number came pretty late, a bit too late, probably. But, but it was very hard to, you know, know the exact number. But we had a kind of guess about that uh, after a while, I guess. Like it would be around this number, but it became much less. First, they actually said six megabytes in total mm -hmm. for everything to us. And we said, no. <laughs> <laughs> Double <laughs> <No>. it. <laughs> yeah. Let's say 10 at yeah. least. Because um, then we had already done it, so much material. Uh, that was already above six megabytes. So uh, we felt like it would be too harsh to just cut it. So we fought for those 10. <laughs> but you had hard. already composed full tracks with full instruments at this point, right? Before they told you that it had to be cut down. Is that right? Both yes and no. Um, most of it had been recorded, um, but 
there was still some leeway to do some creative decisions in the music. Right. Uh, like before we had talked about making a lot of different stems and so wow. on to make it more dynamic. We, of course, we had to cut away a lot of those ideas because more stems means more megabytes, right. right? You can't really get around that. Uh, but I kind of wanted something still. So I made like, there was, it was like a day, night, evening, dawn, a dusk and dawn mm -hmm. light settings inside the game. Like when you went into a, a level, it could be night. And if you went into a level, another level, it could be day, mm -hmm. kind of like that. I kind of wanted the music to follow that in some way. So in some of the songs, I composed it uh, deliberately. Like I intended that, but in the songs I already composed before that became a thing, I just chose the parts I kind of thought sounded like that the most. Interesting. So if, even though the songs are entire songs, I picked places to start from depending on uh, yeah the light setting and made a small little intro before that to ease in the the yeah into that so you don't just start like that but just a small little intro so it felt at least if you play if you don't play the game obsessively <laughs> <laughs> uh, it should feel a little bit more varied in in that sense uh, because it starts from different points in in the track and that's one thing that was an idea that came from these um, um, restrictions. restrictions, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't have those ideas probably if, if if I didn't have that kind of framework to work within. Because then I would have gone crazy with lots of different stems and dynamics and <laughs> so on instead. So yeah, I think that was a big part, like how to minimize and maximize at the same time how much a little music there were like the the feeling of it is still that there's quite a lot of music but actually it's not <laughs> it's just so seven how many tracks. actual different music tracks were there and then of course you have multiple variations on those as far as those uh, intros at different points but how many total separate tracks would you say there are in the game if i remember correctly it's just seven tracks Okay. And three of them are on about three minutes long. Uh, and then three of them are about one minute long. Okay. So, yeah. And the three of them are like on the chapter screen, because mm -hmm. it's like a chapter screen and you can scroll it or swipe it and you will go infinity over a map, kind of. Right. But it will change in setting. And so the music will change as well. And that music is quite, uh, I had so fun with that because. Uh, I made this music, at, at least there I could have a little bit of STEM uh, fun. <laughs> uh, like I made the music in the exact same BPM and, and tonality and so on and used the same melodies, but then the instrumentation changed mm. when you went to, if you went into the bamboo forest, it, the instrumentation became more Asian-like mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, but if you were in the pig city, it was much more brass and... Right more gritty but it was still the same melody uh, that went over and over again so it felt more like you know something dynamic going on there and you uh, used fabric right yes yeah <laughs> awesome and that was so, go ahead so the game itself uh primarily unity based with the fabric plugin on top basically yeah exactly um and then we had to of course do a lot of other extended features for that but uh, not, not, not that much, not that much. Uh, Jonathan made a thing where he used, uh, he made a plugin uh, that a stereo spreader plugin. Right, made right. Talk about that, phone. how you were able to get that, uh, basically you compressed everything to mono and then made a delay, but talk about that, how Jonathan did well, that. Well, uh, I have to give that uh, credit entirely to Jonathan because that was his idea. Yeah. Uh, and I have, I didn't do much with that, uh, but but that was the juice, kind of how to <laughs> how to make this work. Because when you you know, uh, mono makes half the size budget, you know, right. because stereo doubles the size. So we could cut all the music uh, megabyte budget 
into half you speak mm -hmm. it in mono and and then we would use stereo spreader very simple you know thing it's just duplicate the track that is already there and then you know just push it a little bit to the right yeah and then uh or not to the right not to the right but push it a little bit in time in no. time about what 10 15 <laughs> milliseconds and then you basically you yes, pan one track time. to the right pan one track hard left and then you you delay one by yeah. 10, 15 uh, a very typical steer spread you know no, nothing yeah. super weird <laughs> but it worked wonders because not only did we get that but suddenly we noticed that the entire kind of mix inside the game we got a bit more spread out as well right. because we have sound effects they already are panned sometimes you know mm -hmm. but we pan the music so much so it feels a bit more like the music is not here you know it's like right. almost at that point and then you have the the sound effects like that so it felt more like fulfilled in a sense when you put up put in headphones so I want to circle back a little bit too about where your paths converged again in terms of because you were working at these these uh, multiple places and kind of they they sort of reconverged at some point and now you're working together in the, out of the same studio. Can you talk about that and um, uh, sort of the the where where you sort of came back together? I guess. Yeah. Well, we had our internships to start with, and then. Uh, after my internship or my sound uh, design job ended at EC, I went over uh, to DICE for a while as QA to work on Battlefield 4. So I worked on that for a while and just until it released and then my contract ended and that was kind of like right after that, that was about when we found uh, we found out about Aragami or what it was called at that time, it was called Path of Shadows. We saw that they were posting on a forum around December 2013, I think, when we were kind of looking to find something to get the ground. Which forum, again. by yeah. the way? TIG forum, I think TIG, it was. TIG source, yeah, TIG source. TIG source forums. And uh, we, we, were looking, we were looking through like 120, 30 uh, in the yeah, game side before just we looking kind of started to buy that one. I'm like, huh, this looks interesting, actually. Yeah, and <laughs> then we found it like 130 pages later. And we thought it looked really cool. And we just emailed, uh, uh, David, who was like the person to email at that time. Uh, <laughs> he was the only person we could find. Him. Yeah, we, <laughs> we didn't found his email. email him, we PM'd him. Oh yeah, we, yeah. okay, sure. <laughs> and we just asked him, hey, your game looks really cool. Do you have someone who does audio in general for it? And they didn't have one because they had just um, finished. They were just finishing school as well. Uh, and um, they're main end project for school was create a game in about 10 months I think it was or a year mm -hmm. and they made that path of shadows demo uh which kind of I, I guess it caught a buzz on reddit and other different websites cool and they thought let's make a game out of this and that was about when we came in, came in as well hmm. so we started talking to david he was he just came down to stockholm as well so we met him yeah there was uh that's a fun little anecdote yeah. about that that he had just played Hammerwatch. Oh yeah, that's And true. he was going to Stockholm for New Year's Eve so everything as a vacation, made sense. Uh, wow. so he could also put this up. Uh, so, so we, we met talk. him and <laughs> we talked and we kind of got the job. So that's how we started working on our next project together again. Uh, so yeah, so it was like in the beginning of 2014. Yeah, and you were on that full time, uh, and I did things when I could for a while. Yeah, I <laughs> and. Uh, you know, like that. And then it started to become more and more from my part as well. And so we merged exactly. finally after some Tokaboka work in between as well. Yeah. Now let's listen to another clip. This one is called Path of Shadows from the upcoming game Aragami. <laughs> Thank you. 
I wanted to I wanted to ask a question quickly about um, the dice connection. So you went and worked with the Battlefield team, obviously a super professional team. In fact, they have some of the best audio uh, um, in any games. I, I feel in terms of sound design. Did you, in, when you were working QA, did you specialize in audio? Or were you kind of working with the QA department on all the different, um, uh, with all the different uh, uh, assets? It was mostly uh, all different assets. I was primarily working on the uh, tablet commander that they had. So it was more in terms of, you know, the general QA quality control, making sure they worked and everything. So. I mean, we did check some audio as well for it, but it wasn't really specific for audio. Right. But uh, I, I did speak to a lot of them, and like I, we, we were very close to the studio, so you could always peek in and like, how's it going? Because <laughs> right. you, you have to do that, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, nice. But okay. Yeah, they're, they're very, very good at what they We've been there to, to visit a few times. We have. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so did you sense. get to work, or you met Ben Mento and his team over there? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Great, pe great people, really. Great people. They always arrange a party. Yeah, it's a year. Christmas audio party. Yeah. <laughs> or, well, basically, it's... We it's, will all audio people get drunk. Yeah, we go to dive, <laughs> and we drink, and we have fun. Super that's fun. that's one thing that I did want to ask about too. One of the ways that um, you know people get into the industry and and also learn a lot too. There's there's various communities around the world where there's game audio communities where people get together. You know either either you know on a regular basis or um, uh, I know Seattle has a really great infrastructure for that. Do you find that your community is supportive of one another there, or, and do you meet regularly? Um, and this may go outside of just the audio community. Maybe uh, 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 there might be game um, designer meetups as well. Can you describe the sort of community that you're you're in there? Yeah, sure. I mean, we can start by saying that the community for game development is at least uh, is very very good uh, in terms of first off in Stockholm, like all the companies are five minutes apart from each other, so it's very close. So what happens very often is we have these game dev. Uh, drinking evenings like we go we have this we have this local bar where we just hang out like give the give game dev only mm -hmm. uh, and just to some friends maybe. and also friends yeah but they kind of the game they like uh, rents one floor of the bar mm -hmm. and people can just hang out and bring friends and whatever and then you have people from dice avalon starbase just everybody hanging out and king and Roby yeah uh, the people want so it, to come. It's a very good community just for just meeting people and hanging out, and it's yeah, it's very nice to not have to. I think the I th would say that the game development, um, like what people usually think, I don't know. Now I said against myself. Uh, the the everything else except audio. It's very good to go on these things, like all the uh, artists and all the programmers and so on and so on. Uh, but I don't know, the audio community in Sweden in general, I would say is a bit more scattered, uh, it feels like. I think Ben is the one who's holding the <laughs> <laughs> the drumstick there, or whatever you call it, uh, to try to get everyone together at least once a year, um, mm. while everyone else you kind of meet at least once a month uh, <laughs> to hang out with. Uh, and like you said, it's like a little bit of like a hub or something yeah. like this, you call it like the Stockholm, what would you, I don't know, uh, a cluster almost. Yeah. Of just because everyone is in almost the same spot in Stockholm, um, in an area of Stockholm, uh, like combined together. I mean, the, the new dice buildings together with the new Avalanche I building. Think so. Yeah, so yeah. they're now sitting in the same building, and Avalanche before that sat in the same building as Paradox. Uh, and Rovio is just 10 minutes from there, and so on, and so on. It's like <laughs> a little circuit, so it's very easy to meet up. And through through that, through the power of alcohol, we have uh, <laughs> nurtured a very fine, uh, not refined, but fine <laughs> yeah. uh, community for ourselves, I think. Yeah. <laughs> That is very warm and very welcoming, and to towards all. Yeah, wow, that's fantastic. <laughs> um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about uh, origami. 
And uh, also, what instruments do you both play? And I think you, you're multi-instrumentalists. So yeah, if you can talk a little bit about that. To, I, I, I just want to say first that uh, there's nothing released for the soundtrack that is the actual soundtrack. Right. So the things we have released is from that old Kickstarter and we have just mm. let it be there as history, kind of, you know. It's nice to just, instead of thinking like, ah, oh, but that would be bad, I don't know, PR. <laughs> it's nice to have that kind of bit of history left there that, oh, this is the track we, we So made it's totally this, new. You know? What you've done now is completely different than what's out there. Uh, it's quite different now, actually. Um, the the lots of the recordings are now real, which uh, mm. is uh, <laughs> a huge step up. And yeah. we have also, uh, instead of mixing and mastering ourselves, we decided to hire someone else to do that. Uh, yeah. A guy called Chris Elms that also have mixed for Björk, if you know the oh, artist. Yeah. Wow. So and he's doing some really amazing stuff with those mixes. So we were super happy um, about that so far. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so the, one of the soundtrack is done actually next next week. Uh, next week on Wednesday is the last day we will put our hands on the soundtrack and then it will be like not done because it's still done late, from our side. But done from our side. Uh, then it's just mixing left and so on. And now it's time for another clip. This is from the song Hidden Leaf, Silent Dragon. So one of the biggest challenges with um, doing music for games is is live instruments and getting budgets for live instruments. Was was Sony help, willing to help out with that in terms of when when Sony got involved to start uh, 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 budgeting for musicians for your project, or was that part of your budget, your overall audio budget that you sort of had to work out? Um, can you describe that process just a little bit? It's, it's very very easy to say about our process with the budgeting. Uh, we've done it all ourselves, the two of us. <laughs> I would like to say that uh, Sony, uh, I mean, we don't really talk that much with Sony. We are a third part uh, in, in terms of the relationship with Sony and the Linsworks, and Linsworks is the one who make the game. Uh, we make, you know, the music and audio was like a third party, I guess, I guess you so. know, uh, into that relationship. <laughs> We haven't directly spoken so much with, with them uh, as they have. So we are not very, we don't really know that much about their cooperation, only that we know that they really, like Linsworks, are very happy with them. Uh, but the amount of money that we've gotten from them is very set. And um, the budget was never really discussed. Uh, the music budget was never really discussed in that sense more than um, that we now get paid uh, for the first time <laughs> in this entire thing, uh, which we are very happy with, but we are putting that money into our own ambition because their ambition in the music and our ambition in the music might look a bit different in terms of real instruments and so on. So, and we kind of really wanted that because this is our baby project yeah. in, in a sense. So, so we made the decision to, if, if, cause we're the ones who really want to 
add this live instruments. Yeah, we're the one who's pushing for that to happen. Right. And felt weird to try to, you know, they are already very limited on the amount of money and, and so on. So it would feel a bit wrong to just ask for more and more <laughs> for our, you know, passion and ambition in this. So were, I see all I kinds of were... uh, guitars and banjos and things like that in the background. Which instruments do each of you play? Oh, yes. So, uh, so I my main instrument is the guitar, and that's kind of where I'm stationed right now. I play the bass, and I've been fiddling with piano and things you work with when you w write music for games, kind of like that. And we have some banjos and a mandolin. And... Are you usually? Yeah, I, I like the things. string instruments, kind of. Yeah, me then. <laughs> And I play the bass in the band, but that's the only uh, <laughs> really that kind of instrument I'm halfly good at. <laughs> but your main halfway instruments, good. you started with. My the... main instruments are piano and flute, like the silver flute, or mm -hmm. I don't know. I think it is called a flute in in yeah. English, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah right. And there's yeah. also that always confuses me because it feels like a very special flute, not the flute, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Well, there's a bamboo flute or other kinds of shakuhachi flute and things yeah, like I that. Have yeah, a, I have a shakuhachi here. It's, oh, cool. It's beautiful. I want to show it. <laughs> <laughs> Grab it. <laughs> your, your choices. It's so beautiful. Uh, I'll it for, for this. That's not the one. Okay. The other one. Not that one. Yeah. yeah. No, the, the light one. I have three. <laughs> this one. <laughs> oh, nice. Look at it. It's so beautiful. Wow. And it's like And so how does it sound? Well, I, I'm not super good at it yet. Uh, I just bought it to to have fun with, just to get the feel of it. But now yeah. we're hiring a musician, uh Kristen Nigus, who's uh based in Florida. Oh wow. Uh, who, yeah, she's doing all the woodwinds and she's much better on the shakati. <laughs> 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 so cool. but I can do some effects like, you know, a few. Stuff like that, you know, nice. it's just like very easy things, but it's a bit hard to blow into this thing when you're used to do that. Yeah. <laughs> it's like to blow it like in a bottle almost. Right, right. <laughs> you know, scary stuff like that. It's nice. <laughs> cool. And for the origami, it's a Japanese base. It's set in Japan or in China? I guess in Japan, right? No. It's no? kind of like a, uh, it's very <laughs> heavily it's inspired by Japan and China, but it's never really s explained that it is in Japan. It's more of a... Um... It's a made-up land. Okay, yeah. yeah I, it didn't, I couldn't tell for sure from the, from the graphics. It looked like a mixture. And yeah. the it story is, is the main character is like an assassin who's raised from the dead, and he's trying, to, and he's uh, got a soul mate, essentially, the, the, the woman that raised him. Right. And so can you tell us a little bit more about the story and how that impacts your music and your sound design? Yeah, sure. So basically the game, it's about, like mentioned, Aragami, who has been reawoken from the dead by Yamiko, who is the lady you mentioned, who um, who needs his help by to rescue her from the uh, bad guys. Yeah. Uh, and so she helps him out uh, to reawaken it so she, he can help her out. And... During the gameplay, she keeps telling it because you you wake up without without your memory, and she uh, starts uh, telling you you know what happened before and everything that. And when it comes to the music, we really try to like we haven't really written a very stealth specific soundtrack for the game. We really wanted to focus more on uh, the story or and the environments in general. Mm -hmm. um, because we feel like with the visual, like the, the art and with the game is very stylized. So we kind of wanted that with the music as well, instead of having very you know, like heavy stealth music where you always had on. It, we have that as well, of course, but we wanted to focus more on the characters and the environment you're in. So it's a bit more melancholic and... Extremely melancholy. <laughs> Extremely <Yeah>. melancholy. <laughs> That's and, uh, like, I really think. It's not sad, it's not happy, it's like, you know, but it's not like plain. It's just like you get this a bit of heavy-hearted yeah. feeling so all the time. So <laughs> we kind we we start out by kind of having the music telling you, telling play like you're not sure what's going on. But as you progress the game, it kind of 
you kind of learn what these melodies you've been hearing means. You kind of hear. Oh, cool. All right. Yeah, yeah, we have touched a lot of it. There's a lot of motif works, mm -hmm. you know, like using. Do you say motifs? Yes, motifs. I think so. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's kind of like <laughs> each character has a certain motif, which is played during a special section of the game, and maybe later you'll notice why it was played at that place. And but not like... the, not just the characters, but also certain parts of the story has its own melody. So uh, even though I mean, there's a lot of these hidden things in the story, right? That we have not told. Of course, it can't be yeah. <laughs> just the just the premise. It's never just the premise, right? <laughs> Uh, and so during the journey, we'll try to make sure that even though things will not be said, um, might not never be said even, uh, but rather implied, mm -hmm. or uh, so it will also be implied into the music, uh, in a sense, uh, in how we use these different motifs. Very difficult to show or to talk about without trying to spoil anything. Right. <laughs> well <laughs> This, this brings up like a, a very interesting quandary, especially for um, uh, composers within games, that a, a lot of times motifs end up, or, or thematic material end up being on cutscenes because the story exposition tends to be in, in the cutscenes. So you learn about the characters in the, in the cutscenes. And I, I feel like it's particularly challenging in gameplay to have those kind of, um, uh, the same kind of thematic and uh, motific elements sort of support supporting characters unless it's a um maybe it's a fighting game for instance uh where like in killer instinct each each character has their own uh own sort of theme and um so uh can you talk at all about how you uh, is it in gameplay or is it in story exposition? yeah sure uh we do have some of that in cutscenes as well because of course that's kind of the easiest way of doing it like for example if you introduce a character you can show his or her motif. Um, we try to do it a lot in the actual gameplay music as well. For example, we can have a certain character might have, or a certain scenario might have a special music, and then you have a cutscene regarding something from the past, perhaps. And when you talk about the past, and maybe that the past has a certain melody, so that melody can be played in the music, in the gameplay music afterwards. So you kind of get the feel like, oh, we just talked about this, now we keep going. And there's a certain melody that just showed up in the music. Wonder if that has a connection to what we just saw. So I think it's more in terms of that style of how yeah. we portray motifs in just gameplay music when there's more interactivity with the player. Yeah, I would like to add to that that. Um, we have actually focused more on, on trying to get these motifs first into the gameplay before any cutscenes. Um, there are a lot of times we're foreshadowing <laughs> stuff like melodies. My, we might not use the entire thing, but there's quite a lot of times that when you go through the setting and the level, we will use the melody of the thing that will happen in the end, right? <laughs> uh, so instead of having cutscene, melody introduced we have level melody introduced then cutscene mm. melody fully used mm. kind of uh, to to try to get that kind of, of of motifs into the into the gameplay music but it's hard to use it all the time because uh, we don't want to have audio fatigue and so on so you kind of want to to of course not only have melodies but still we kind of also want that kind of I don't know. Maybe it would call, be called retro now. I don't know. Mm -hmm. With lots of melodies in in the game music, um, uh, instead of having ambience, right? In, like the opposite, right? Um, to have something memorable and not try to do too many randomizations and so on, um, but instead do quite long tracks uh, instead yeah. of of using lots of randomization randomizations we do quite long tracks and maybe silence in, in between yeah uh, for for example we mentioned before that we kind of uh agreed on the same games and game music when we met and those were all basically like the old final fantasy games and chrono trigger and all those japanese rpg games which, which are very heavy on the melodic parts and the sure. characteristics of yeah. the melody as well and 
it's, it's kind of funny. Whatever we do, we, we it always happens. It's kind of our go-to thing. It's, like we, it's a curse. It's, I call it a curse. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're very prone of using that style in when we write music. Like we we love having these melodies and we love writing that way. So if even if we make us. It doesn't still... matter what game we make, it's always saying JRPG. Well, it's not every <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it, That's how it feels like, if, at least. Sometimes it's like, and we're, we're noticing in this game as well, like, oh, we use a lot of melodies, like we they kind of use in the old RPGs. That's... But it's not just the melodies, it's just no. the way it's done. I, I can't even set the p- finger let's, on it. Let's talk about that. Know, let's talk about the way it's done a little bit. And what kind of, uh, are you using any middleware? Are you just, uh, you know, what, what, what kind of... Uh, adaptive music system are you using in the game? It's fabric this time too. Great. <laughs> and we don't use a lot of adaptiveness inside uh, for the music. We have focused more on uh, content uh, of, of what you call it, quantity. To uh, Not that we didn't focus on quality, <laughs> <laughs> but um, a lot of quantity means that for these two people, since we also make all the sound effects and implementations inside this game and so on, we will have to choose to to not be crazy with certain things. And one of those things has been to be too adaptive to certain things. So inside the game, one thing that comes to mind that we have done is um, that we have one layer that we call the caution layer. So whenever an enemy mm-hmm. see you, but not we have seen you and notice you and it gets a little question mark above his head and uh, like huh uh, <laughs> we put this layer that is like less melodies we strap it off the music that is already playing off of melodies and put in a bass and that goes like doom, 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 to you know mm. get that kind of tension suddenly right. and so it goes a lot of back and forth into that yeah. and also some like sometimes a cutscene go into uh, like a, a cutscene, movie-esque cutscene goes into them talking a little bit and then we will have to move the music that was in the cutscene have to go into this loop but when they have talked, you know, because we don't know the pacing they will like right. read in so it will have to go into a loop and then it will have to continue its uh, movement in the cutscene. <laughs> but apart from that you're not using a lot of loops it sounds like. We do use a lot of loops, but we don't loop them um, in infinity. <laughs> ah. Yeah. So yeah. random amount of loops within a certain range, and then some silence, yeah. and then it might come back. Got it. Got it. One of the um, one you mentioned silence before, and quite a few of the JRPGs that you mentioned don't use a whole lot of silence. It's it's kind of music sort of from front, front to end. If you look at other sort of uh, uh, Japanese games, uh, especially horror games, there's there's a lot more of silence in those. But the ones that you referenced are very melodic and they have lots of. Can you talk a little bit about um, how you use silence in in the upcoming game and and what you think of it in in terms of your own style and how you're um, uh, sort of pursuing music in games? How we use silence or how we use the music <laughs> or both? Well, do you, you, you mentioned a little bit before that you do use silence in your music, um, where yeah. some of the titles that you mentioned don't use a lot, um, a, a typical JRPG like Final Fantasy or Chrono Trigger. All right. There's yeah. quite, quite a bit of music. Um, well, uh, this is more of a suspense game, so maybe you're you're headed more into a direction where um, you, you're looking at other games like Silent Hill or Resident Evil and things like that. But I, I would just be curious about how you're thinking about um, uh, your comment before about using silence mm. in your in your music. Yeah, uh, sure. I mean, yeah, as I mentioned before, our our, our roots is from the JRPG mu- music, but you you still have to think of what is this game. Uh, for example, I've I. I've played some stealth games, and it's always nice when you have this. Uh, it's not always music. You have this, you know, s- suspenseful sneaking around and all that. So you you don't want all the music uh, music all the time, I'd say. And since we also make the sound effects, we can kind of play around with having these ambient environment mm. areas in the game, where it's much more focused on how the wind blows and how exactly you push forward. So we can play with 
not have music at all, but play much more with the sound design as well. So since this is a uh, suspenseful game, you have these stealth uh, areas. You kind of want to play with not having music, well, I say. I, I think it's interesting what you said that we're, we can also uh, play with soundscapes, and that can also be our music, in a sense, mm -hmm. uh, is that from an uh, audio pipeline perspective, we also know when the music will mask <laughs> kind of uh, the audio a little bit. So we know which parts of the game we should really focus more on the sound design <laughs> and which we should focus more on the music, which is because we really have to think about our restrictions as we're just two people. It's a pretty long game um, between six to eight hours gameplay. Um, it's about 70 minutes of music uh, in total. Hmm. So quite a lot of work to, to do um, with cutscenes and so on and a lot of story and and so we actually chose to have a made up language to make sure to that we don't have to deal with uh, localizations and proper voice acting <laughs> <laughs> and so on. Uh, we can use ourselves and our friends and so on instead for that. Um, but we can use that. And the silent part comes in, I think, mostly it's, it's either um, in certain areas. We usually uh, divide the level in, in areas, right? Um, and I think the silence is mostly effective either in the right in the beginning of the level or towards the end rather than in the middle. That's what I've noticed mm -hmm. quite a lot. Uh, because when you start a new level, might be a new chapter, you get that little title screen that says, oh, you are now entered the uh, chapter four. Chapter or four, <laughs> and it says like a chapter name, right? Uh, and it's quiet, that can be extremely effectful. Uh, but only if that's the rare occasion, that's very effective. Um, usually we start a chapter with some music and then it might fade away at least, some kind of stinger. But if you have like nothing at all, it really brings attention to where you are much more than if music would be there. Even though we have worked a lot to make the music, uh, like get the inspiration from what kind of setting mm -hmm. we are in. And here's a final clip from a song called Fox Tears from the game Aragami. So the last question I would have about the music and sound design is, did you combine those in the game? And you mentioned stingers just a minute ago. How did you work with stingers in the music and how do you incorporate those in the middle work? Uh, the stingers are not that advanced. There's not many stingers used <laughs> in, in, in the middle of the music. So no exciting there. It's just like uh, some some small little, I don't know, shit a thing. <laughs> they're, very, they're, they're very based on when you enter a new location. Yeah. Kind of like you, you walk into this past door and you, you get to this mountaintop and then we have this thing that triggers, oh, you see the area. And then maybe afterwards we trigger the music after that. So it's kind of like we introduce new areas. With I have one there. You actually. have one there. Okay. I have one that is a bit more at not advanced, but we made oh, yeah. like we made a stinger based where if you can, will only hear this thing if you look at a certain object, uh, so we can base if um, if you go into this trigger inside uh, the engine or like in, inside the game, uh, and but it will only trigger if you also with the camera looking out where we to a po certain point. Cool. Uh, so we have like in level two, there's like it's opening up much more than it has before because before that 
uh, it's tutorials, so it's much more narrow. Everything is much more linear, corridory to just guide you through, like in level one. And then it opens up in, in level two quite a lot, suddenly. And we felt like, because it's opening up and you can see this entire kind of landscape almost, but just not landscape in, in that sense, but you know, this entire well, thing, the environment. environment, it very, opens up a lot. We felt like if you actually are looking at that point when you're standing here <laughs> at this specific, you know, spot, because it will not be as cool if you're like, there's a staircase, you know, uh, like that. So if you're on top of that staircase, but since you have this shadow leap, function where you can teleport, we don't know if they will actually use the staircase <laughs> to, right. to go down, right? But we kind of felt like if you stand on that point and looking out, it should have some cool musical stinger of some sort, or at least a melody or something happening here. So we <laughs> made a small little system for just doing <laughs> that and we have only used it there. Very <laughs> <laughs> very location based. Yeah. But uh, might use some more. Well, we, hopefully we, we can find something. And yeah, we have sure. done stuff like that quite a lot in the music that uh, the music always are divided into uh, different parts where it will loop inside itself and then go further because yourself as player will get further into the level. So you get to a new area and then it will go further into the music, oh, but still cool. the same music track, yeah, right? For example, like cool. we might have a five minute long song and we divide it in three parts, mm -hmm. uh, which yeah, like loops by itself. Almost. So at this first area, it, this song plays for two minutes and then you progress. And then this next just uh, cross crossover fluently can, they are basically this very, very similar. So they fade in between each other very good. And, and then, the beat synced as well. And the Inside beat sync, of course. Yeah. Fabric, and yeah. then you progress to the next area, and then you get the final version of the song. And... But the very interesting part of that is that we have used a lot of, uh, we call it a special object, if I remember it correctly, inside our scripts, uh, that you can also assign instead of a trigger, there can be a trigger there uh, that will choose, like, okay, if you go through this trigger, it will, um, uh, the sequence will advance, right? Um, but we also have made sure that, but you can also do this action that will make sure that the sequence will wow. advance. And we call it special object, like uh, one certain point is in tutorial where the first time you meet an enemy, you will just hear like taiko drums go. Mm -hmm. Doom. Doom. Yeah, and and it's a, like a small little area, like a squared area. And the guy is standing with his back towards you because this is the first enemy, but you can choose to either kill him or, you know, just progress. You don't have to do, and that's the thing with Origami's core gameplay is that you don't have to be the mean ma killing machine if you don't want to. You know? Right, a little you bit like be, Thief or something. Yeah, exactly. exactly, you can choose how you play it. Like right. if you want to pass everybody, you can, oh, sorry. Yeah, exactly. And uh, if you kill this guy, the music will also progress. Just to make Got sure it. that the the feeling is still, you know, that you progressed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically. <laughs> yeah, if, you cool. choose to, if you choose to kill him, the music progresses. If you just walk past him, the music, the music will progress as well. It's just how we choose, how you choose to. And we have done a lot of those kind of triggering. So we have thought, I think there's a lot of game design t thinking, like back from my days in game design. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a lot of that kind of what did the player did do? right at this point, then why are we triggering this, not only this part of the music, but also stuff like, not just because you came into a new setting, it doesn't mean you have to have music, that's not progress, but maybe you learned a new shadow technique uh, or something else, uh, and we just say, or use something for the first time, um, like the, the first level, it's easier to talk about the first level because then we don't really spoil that much. Um, that um, right after you have talked to Yamiko and the awakening has happened and kind of the story has just set in motion, uh, we have this little safe spot music kind of that feels very pleasant listening to. It's like mild, just looping, quite, quite a short loop though. Yeah. Uh, and not until you actually use your first shadow power to go, you have to like teleport through a fence kind of thing. That's like the first puzzle, mm -hmm. right? Not until that very point, we will start 
the melancholy of the game. <laughs> okay. Does the character yeah. feel the weight of their burden? Okay. Uh, yeah, and, and I, I like to think that it's like, oh, I'm alive again. I can use these cool powers. And you said, and I realized, oh, it's shadow techniques. And then the melancholy starts. Like, oh. Right. So it's very I much mean, like scoring a film in this way. I mean, you're really, you've gone into great detail, you know, matching the character's mood and the, the story of the game. Fantastic. Um, Michael, did you have... Did you have any other questions uh, on this topic? No, I, I actually have to have to run, oh. and I hate to like um, break up the party, but I have to I have to run, so I'm going to drop uh, out. But Dale, if you want to continue, but um, I think it's been fabulous. I think all this information has been really exciting to hear, and it's been nice to hear your sort of thinking process behind sort of uh, especially this end stuff where you're talking about uh, uh, decisions in the levels and and different ways that you're approaching music and how it relates to thematic development and, and things like that. So it's been really exciting to hear, especially to like uh, advancing music and making really long tracks. Really great stuff. I really enjoyed it. So um, let's talk a little bit. The last question about your future. What do you, what kind of things do you have uh, coming up and uh, what, what's what are in the works? <laughs> We're both, like, looking at each other. Uh, well, first we should off, talk about it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for having us. First of all, it's been great. Uh, our plans after this i mean we're we're getting to be finished with origami which is great it's so much fun and it's so interesting to see how how it will proceed now since we've been working for working on it for a while now and for the future we're we're still going to work with games of course um still looking over what's happened what's happening after this got some yeah. things that might uh be very interesting uh, yeah we yeah. might have something up but we're also looking so yeah, that's course. out there. <laughs> and uh, you had mentioned something about a band. Uh, yes, right. yeah. we do. Uh, we kind of like, like we talked about before, we were used to being a band uh, called Overworld. Uh, right now, we're kind of starting up something. I I wouldn't call it maybe a band. It's more like a the two of us doing metal stuff <laughs> and seeing <laughs> where it goes. Uh, but we have been working on that for a while, and we've been recording some songs for that. Very melodic, a bit Nightwish inspired. Yeah, uh, something around that area. Music, symphony and, metal. And uh, wow, we call symphonic it, metal with symphonic <laughs> cool. metal. We call it RPG metal. Yeah, because it still <laughs> sounds like, of course, <laughs> like that. Still there, sounds like a game. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot of uh, you know interest in that. There's uh, of course uh, video games live, uh, video game orchestra, uh, Orvar Sastrum's. Uh, <laughs> You know, group yeah. there in Sweden, um, lots of uh, you know Magfest, so should be uh, pretty interesting once. Uh... I've always wanted to go to Magfest. Yeah, actually. that sounds cool. Sounds so cool. We yeah. have this grand future, such super future plan yeah. about live performances that we hope to at least keep the you know the rights when it comes to rights of music. You don't always have can keep everything, you know, but mm -hmm. we try to keep at least live performance rights, so we don't have to ask for. Permission. <laughs> That's great. Uh, so we can have, yeah. so we can have this like, in our mind, big two feathers super, orchestra. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll because, absolutely have that dream someday. Because you know? I guess that going back again to the old <laughs> RPGs, like the Final mm -hmm. Fantasy music is played all around the world. We went to a concert yesterday. Yeah. And I mean, the, a huge dream would be, of course, to be able to have one of those on your own. Uh, uh, or just one song played. In, yeah. In or just a song played in a or a concert. Mini, mini dream of the future, but that's yeah, dreams right. of the future, not the actual <laughs> now future. No, no, it's not a future that is actually uh, confirmed, but no. we're, <laughs> that is well, something we always aim for. The, the first video game music that was performed, of course, was in the in-house bands at Sega and so on. They, basically, that's how video game music started as a fad, in, in Japan first, and then, of course, over here through some of the other orchestras and so on. So, yeah. Yeah, I was actually in a cover band uh, during like between when I was 16 and 18 uh, and uh, I was in a cover band we only made uh, music like cover from from games games music oh, cool. uh, rock covers <laughs> and we went <laughs> uh, and we played at different conventions uh, like anime conventions cool uh, <laughs> very geeky <laughs> but we called it the geek uh, from geeks to the geeks kind of that was ah. our like motto in a sense, uh, and only it was awesome. And everyone in the front row would take the shirts off, even the ladies. <laughs> was like going crazy. 
<laughs> for video game music. Fantastic. Play more music. music. And, yeah, and they singed along. They're like, da, 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 da. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, that's fantastic. Uh, Thank you both very much. Wish you great success with everything and uh, look forward to uh, hearing this music uh, and playing the game when it comes out. Yeah. Yeah. Be yeah Thank we, you. It will be, we will, of course, release the soundtrack uh, on Spotify and, and other places, even mm -hmm. YouTube probably. Yeah, most uh, certainly. Because. Uh, that's in our rights uh -huh. <laughs> cool. to do so. So you, so, you did you. retain the rights for this uh, music? And what about for the Angry Birds? The soundtrack has just been released. Uh, yeah, the soundtrack was released last year. So okay. maybe not. Uh, but I do not like retain those rights like that. Uh, so it's mostly published by Robio. Yeah. Right. Uh, so that's a bit more tricky. But it's out in, on Spotify and iTunes too right. to listen to, if one wants to, and probably other places like these or or youtube what? probably right uh youtube is probably bootleg yeah that's, <laughs> that's probably i have not put it up not no, no. <laughs> um but you can't find it through our channels uh, unfortunately like through two feathers because we can't really more than that we refer to to spotify right. uh of course on our website well, I'll definitely put uh, some links in the description below for all of your music and all of your uh games that you've created music for so Again, thank cool. you both very, very much. I really appreciate it. And thank you for having us. It was yeah, it's been great. It's been super fun. <laughs> thank you for listening to the Designing Music Now podcast, a podcast dedicated to the craft of creating music for video games and interactive media. Please visit us at designingmusicnow.com for more info, news, and reviews on this subject. We would love to hear from you.